Today a customer brought in this Polaroid LCD TV for repair and after pulling the back off and looking things over I noticed a couple of bad capacitors on the power supply board as often is the case. One of them was obvious and one wasn't obvious. But after looking things over I realized had I just gone out and replaced these two capacitors that wouldn't have fixed it because in this case when these capacitors went bad they caused these two transistors to fail. Now these two transistors here actually drive the inverter transformers and so rather than just going out replacing the capacitors and the inverter board transistors here there's a third step that's wise to take before wasting your money on parts that may not work after you replace them and that's double checking your transformers. Now when you're checking a transformer there's several ways to go about it. One way is just to take your digital volt ohm meter or analog meter whatever you happen to have and to test the resistance across the different coil windings within the transformer. For example, on the primary side of this transformer, I know it has a very low resistance reading between the two. In fact, if I hooked it up to a meter, or let's say I measured one ohm, that might be normal for that coil. But when you're talking about a low resistance reading like that, sometimes you got to wonder, well, gee, is it low because it's shorted out, or is it low because that's normal for this transformer? And that's where I like using this handy little device here called a coil ringer. For example, when I hook it up to this transformer winding here, what it'll actually do is it will uh, light up a given amount of LEDs depending on the quality of the coil or what they call the Q of the coil. You can see here when I hook it on the primary side. Now this coil ringer is made to check primarily the primary side of a coil. Uh, the other thing you want to check for is a resistance reading on the secondary side of your coil. For example, if this were a step-up transformer I might have very few turns on the primary side and on the secondary side I might have many more turns or vice versa but you'd have to have a general idea what the resistance should be but even without knowing the resistance at least you can get a general idea whether the primary side is okay using the ring tester and so that's real handy but the other thing you want to consider is you don't want to find any shorts between your primary and your secondary so when you take your ohmmeter out and you check between here and here you shouldn't have any reading whatsoever it should be infinite same as here and here I don't want to confuse you with too much technical stuff, but I thought you might find this interesting. This is actually showing what my ring tester is doing. I put it into this coil here. What it does is it sends pulses of energy into the coil. And this one line here would represent one pulse. And the way this works is anytime you disconnect the power after sending one pulse of energy into a coil, it doesn't just go away instantly. It tends to oscillate and then it dies down, as you can see here. Now when you're checking a transformer, sometimes it is advisable to unsolder it from the board when you check it, just to make sure it's, your reading isn't being affected by other components that are on the board. Another reason you want to pull off the transformer in some cases, it can be confusing trying to figure out where the primary side is. If we, in fact, if we look at the bottom of this uh, transformer here, we'll see there are actually seven connectors on here, but believe it or not, only four of them are actually used. But if you take your ring tester, and you hook it up to the primary side here, it's pretty obvious when you're on the primary side. That's the indication there that this is a very good coil. Now even though this ring tester is designed to check the primaries of transformers, I find sometimes I can get a reading on the secondary too. Not always, it depends on the transformer. In this case I can hook it up here and we get a little bit of a ring. Uh, the other thing, sometimes you short out your secondary side and you'll see this change on the primary side. Well, now that I've verified that both my transformers are good and that I had two bad transistors and two bad capacitors, I feel pretty good about ordering the parts for this TV and chances are I'm going to make money when I replace all these bad parts here. Now, if you're not familiar with switch mode power supplies, let me recommend you learn about them because if there's one area of LCD TVs you see a lot of failure with, and that's the switch mode power supplies. So. These, uh, these power supplies are really not that complicated except for the fact that they have what's known as feedback circuits. Unlike your older power supplies, which are pretty straightforward and easy to understand, a lot of the newer ones have feedback circuits to regulate their own output. And if they sense something wrong on the output, they send a signal back to the input. And it's a safety factor. Sometimes the feed, uh, television might have uh, two or three different feedback circuits. So. I highly recommend you learn all you can about these switch mode power supplies if you're thinking about doing this sort of thing as a hobby or even as a profession.
Aside from learning all you can about switch mode power supplies and inverters, there's another portion of an LCD TV you want to become familiar with, and that's the main board. Now the main boards can be incredibly intimidating because the parts are so small on them. I mean, you look at this IC down here, for example, you're probably looking at 100 wires coming out of this small IC. And some of these parts are just so small, it's just not realistic you're going to be able to troubleshoot everything. But at the same time, after reading John's book on LCD TV repair, I realized there are a lot of components that I can check. And what's helpful to me is when I look at a main board like this, rather than feeling overwhelmed at this whole maze of confusion, I like to think in terms of block diagrams. Now when I mention block diagrams, I'm, I'm referring to the basic building blocks that comprise an LCD TV. I don't have all of them on this little sheet of paper here, but basically you've got your power supply board, and that supplies power for everything else here. So if the power supply fails, of course the whole TV is going to fail. And you've got your microcontroller unit that interacts with the power supply. You've got your T-Con or controller board. You've got your driver ICs that drive the screen. You've got your backlight. And then you've got your inverter board that supplies power for the backlight. And then, of course, you've got your feedback circuits that might tell the power supply to shut down or they might tell the inverter board to shut down if there's a problem, depending on the TV. But if you just get a general idea of what each voltage should be approximately on these different blocks, it'll help you troubleshoot. And once you've gone through and done some of the basic troubleshooting uh, that you need to do to find out what the voltages should be or if they're missing or whatnot, there'll come a point where you'll realize it's time to bail out or maybe buy a new board, depending on the TV and how much the customer wants to pay. So now I could understand a lot of technicians are going to want to bail out on some of these main board problems, but when it comes to the switch mode power supply, these are very serviceable, and if you haven't read Justine Young's book on switch mode power supplies, I highly recommend it. It's 271 pages, and I'll put a link to it in my info section, and it was it was easy reading. I mean, there was one little section there, I think it was on Power Factor, where I got a little bit confused, but for the most part, I was able to digest, I'd say, about 98-99% of the book. And uh, I'm the type of guy who can be intimidated by some of these technical manuals. They'll put me to sleep or just overwhelm me with too many ideas that are, you know, well beyond what you need to know to service something. I mentioned in a previous video how sometimes when I'm troubleshooting I'll use Mike's TV case histories to help me out. And this is a good example of where they came in handy. I just looked up the Polaroid TV this power supply came out of and then I looked in Mike's TV case histories to see if any other technicians recorded any problems with this particular TV. And sure enough they mentioned a diode that uh, one of the technicians found had been blown on the same set. So that's helpful to me, and also it mentions uh, a couple of capacitors. Well, I already found the bad capacitors it mentions. It didn't say anything about the transistors, so I'll be submitting my find to Mike for his next book. But this is an example of how useful TV case histories can be. And uh, the other thing I want to say is make sure you make yourself like a flow chart when you're working on a TV set. For example, when a TV comes in my shop, a lot of times I may know how to troubleshoot something, but I just forget to use common sense. I'll I'll find myself on the phone with a television repairman friend and I'll be asking him something I really know the answer to and only to embarrassingly find out that you know I didn't really need to ask for help. So for example when a TV comes in my shop the first thing I want to do is try to ascertain what the problem will be based on the symptom. If the customer tells me the TV... For example if an LCD TV comes in my shop the customer might tell me that it shut down in the middle of watching it or the light faded out on the screen before it shut down or the sound quit first. All these little things they can tell me can be helpful. And one of the things I'll want to do when I open up the set, first I want to look at the obvious. Is the fuse blown? Yes, no. If the fuse is okay, is there 160 volts on my main reservoir capacitor? Is there a 5 volt standby voltage? Does the TV turn on and then go into shutdown? These are things that can help you a great deal if you make yourself a flow chart and sort of uh, go down the list and you know hopefully you'll have success at fixing the TV that way